Thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. I work in the School of Computing with the College of Engineering Technology, and I've been involved with online learning almost since I started in 2002, on and off, and also have been in the School of Business and also Computing in various stages. And I also actually taught William here out in Botswana a long time ago, wasn't it? 2012. Oh, was it as recently as that, was it? Oh, right, okay, well, I started teaching there in 2004. Now, mine follows actually on rather nicely from what Paula had been talking about. But one thing that's interesting is that if you can personalise, and here we see some of our educational imperatives here at the university, and in HE worldwide, it turns out, talking to colleagues around the world. We've got problems, issues on diversity. We've wanted to move more and more towards students negotiating their own assessment in one way or another. Um, internationalization, both the curriculum and the assessment, and we've got lots of international students. We've got international colleagues here as well. We want to go for widening particip participation, and we now have from Advanced AG um, and the government an objective to eliminate the BMEI grade deficit. Because in most universities, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. My modules have no deficit. And um, I was put forward by um, Plowden a few years ago for the HEA and TFS because of what I've been doing. I have no BMEI deficit. Because I break taboos all the time. How many of you feel in your teaching, in talking to students, whether in the um, workshops, tutorials, seminars, or the um, new PAT system as well, talking deeply, or getting the students to talk deeply about themselves? We're all a little bit scared, aren't we, about getting a bit close to things. But we really must remember that we, all of us here, and all of our students, are unique. We have our own individual backgrounds, ethnicity, gender, language, etc., etc., etc. New York, Brooklyn, Oxford. Each of the students there is unique. And our question I want to pose to you as we go through this next few minutes is how are you going to get each of those students to provide their own personal insights through their learning mechanisms and their assessments? Do you set them a single assignment which everybody does and by God, it's a bit boring, reading it all, all the same, basically. Same set of references and citations. Or do you give them a big topic, which is relevant to the module, the learning outcomes and so on, and get them to research that little bit which is relevant to them, that really catches their interests, so they can provide their insights about that topic. And they will give you assignments. 2,500, 3,000 words with 50 citations and references and references list. What are the taboos that you are frightened of breaking to get close to your students? How do these taboos stop us helping our students to get the very best out of the work that they do while they're learning. <coughs> because remember, we don't teach them anything virtually. We cannot teach you to learn something. You have to want to learn it. Do you go for Socratic teaching or do you go for didactic? Didactic is just telling them these are the answers, these are the things that you must learn. Or do you get them to learn just by posing questions? 
If we teach question and answer, sorry, you all stop learning. Teach you the questions and you will learn for life. When I was teaching in Sub-Saharan Africa, in SADC, Malawi, and Botswana, Zimbabwe, there's a lovely uh, illustration of this. It's a lovely little um, proverb. If you give me a fish, you feed me for today. If you give me a fishing rod, I can fish and feed my family for the rest of the month or the year. You can go one step further. If I teach you how to design and make the right sort of fishing implement, it might be a net, it might be a rod, then you will feed your family and your, your extended family for, for life. Because even if things change, you will know the questions to be able to design the right thing for the next sort of set of fish that come along, which might not be caught on rods, they may need nets. How do we support our students? That was the title page. Unfortunately, it's actually not very readable. Fourth students and probably a lecture there. Would you ask any of those about where they came from? Or would you just say, oh, there are students here at the University of Derby and that's it. Why wouldn't you ask them individual questions about their background, about where they came from, about what makes them interesting, what's interesting for them? Now, not quite relevant to education per se, but gentlemen here, would any of you dare say to any one of those three ladies there, Wow, that's a fantastic headscarf. Would you? Anybody there? Yes. You would. Good. Ladies, would you do the same to us, gentlemen, or blokes, if we were wearing something interesting? Yes. Good. There are colleagues of mine, not so old as me, who would say, no, I wouldn't dare go there. And yet... I was talking to the lady down on the entrance who was on the registration desk who's got some fantastic tattoos. And I said to her, wow, those are fabulous tattoos. And she said, what do you think she said? She said, stop talking about them. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I have ever said to anybody, strangers in the street or in the university, thank you, that's great. You noticed me sort of thing. But sometimes, we would be scared here because that lady and that lady is probably Muslim and should I be talking to a Muslim girl? Why not? They're wearing beautiful headscarves like I used to here. Yeah, you see? But that's one of the taboos that's so strong that we daren't. I've done all, the, all three of those. A bloke with brilliant hairstyle, a few weeks ago in Tesco's in Derby, a couple, about my sort of age, she was wearing a beautiful full frock about that long, 1960s sort of style with Marilyn Monroe print, it, print on, head prints on it, and a beautiful pair of boots. And her husband had the most gorgeous pair of brown low heel cowboy boots with beautiful painting on the tan. And the lady was wearing beautiful white boots with painting. And we got talking. And I said, wow, those are fantastic. And a bit later on, we got into a discussion about who paid for the flowers, because the lady had, to buy, had chosen the flowers, and I met her just a bit around there while she was holding them. You pay for those or receive them? He's actually paying for it. He normally gets it. And you can get into interesting discussions that lead you to know more about the person. I can use, will you use, ethnicity, origin. I happen to like to understand some of the naming conventions, the structures of names across sub-Saharan Africa. 
And when I get a student coming, obviously, from that part of the world, once I know what their surname is, their family name, I'll have a guess at which part of Africa they came from. And I can broadly get it right between Sub-Sahara, Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, most of the time, and even when it isn't, they'll correct me. And then we can have a discussion, because if they are international students who've come here, that you say for master's students, there's an interesting discussion about their assignments and their projects. Are you going back? Are you intending to go back to where you've, where you've come from? Just to do this. Are you going, coming back, going back to Botswana or to Nigeria or India, wherever? Because if they say yes, then you've got a really interesting coaching session ahead of you about what is your topic going to be that you can take back to add value to, work to your, your employment when you go back to Botswana when you go back to Nigeria? What sort of business are you going to go back into? And so each of these groups has an interesting story, an interesting discussion that will allow them to personalise their assignments for you. They will choose a subject which is incredibly interesting to them. It turns out, by the third year of under, for undergraduates, if you run your modules this way, attendance at the formalities of lectures and tutorials and workshops is irrelevant. The correlation between attendance at the formalities and the grade is R squared equals 0 0.387. There is no correlation. As long as they have applied appeared for their formative review in week 11 or week 12 for a 15 minute appointment for a discussion with feedback that they can feed forward into the submission four weeks later in the first week of exams. They will engage with their problem and the subject even if they haven't engaged with attendance. Kind of interesting. And the mo module averages, 70 to 75 percent. First part, first time pass, generally 100 percent. It's interesting what you can do when you start getting into the heads of the students. Break all of the taboos that you can think of. There's only one I haven't yet. Crossed. LGBTQ. What I'm thinking of doing to get that one underway is wear the rainbow lanyard and see if that triggers discussions. But I suspect that there are some absolutely fascinating insights from particularly the team. They've seen it from both perspectives. And that could be absolutely amazing if you can get a student to open up on that by themselves. I'm not going to push that one. That is still far too dangerous. But if they open up a discussion on that, I think there's going to be something really, really interesting that will come out of that. I'll wait to see what happens over the next year or two, whether I have that opportunity. A student a bit like that, <clears throat> and he's been in his wheelchair, in that motorised wheelchair, for something like 10 years, I think it is. <coughs> he was looking at this group, the second students were looking at these Internet of Things, sensors and switches and online stuff, you know, Apple, the, the switches, lights on and so on, and he decided he wanted to do smart homes. This is where the home Alexa or whichever one kind of listens for the hey, switch on the mics or whatever. And we had a very interesting discussion about here he is, in his wheelchair, quite seriously disabled. It was he going to do it from the perspective of an ordinary person like me, 
Well, what's he going to do with Simon from the perspective of him in his wheelchair? Because he has insights that probably none of us have here about where the switches are. You know, the light switches, the plugs on the wall, and so on. And the problems of Alexa not actually recognizing your voice some of the time. So that was an interesting one. And then we see a whole range of other possibilities where we can explore with the students where they will get the insights which are spectacular. You see, a lot of what I do outside university is talk to uh, in business conferences, CIOs, CXOs, all of those senior people, things to do with modern emerging IT products, <coughs> AI and so on. <coughs> and all of these people have insights which are valuable to businessmen as they start their journey towards incorporating some of these new technologies that they've never even thought of. That people, our students who have made it like that, all the other ones that we've seen the pictures of, they can bring insights which are really important to business people out there. As they think about how do we implement these new technologies? Are they going to be valuable to us? Are they going to be valuable to our customers? Which customers? Oh, well, we're really thinking about the people, the white intelligentsia who love technology. And we'll provide all these clever things for them who've got far too much money and can waste $1,000 on a juice pressing gadget. There are many, many things that are much more valuable if we listen to all of our students. They will tell us stuff that we can then use and publish outside. The big acknowledgement to them. All of these other ways of learning that uniqueness that's really important. They can then see that they are making a difference. Following on from something that Paula was saying, she showed those two or three versions of that statistics course. It turns out, based on work and experiment done in Scandinavia, with two identical sets of teaching and learning materials, but differently badged and marketed. One was effectively Bridge Building 101. Here is how you go about the design and stress analysis and so on and so forth of civil engineering for designing a bridge. Typically, 95% male um, applications. The other one, same, exactly the same content, but advertised as bridge building or building bridges. In other words, doing something useful, leading to some social societal benefit. 50-50 male, female. So we can use all of these things, different ways of talking with our students, building that relationship which gets them to deliver spectacular performance. I've taken you through ethnicity, gender, basic male, female, gender, disability, diversity, and so on. How many of those taboos do you feel affect you? Are you willing, carefully, to see how you can break those uh, taboos to get your students delivering stunning pieces of work? First year, I have a module or half a module, Introduction to Computer Science, which is all about skills, learning to be an employable uh, person. That link there, I'll put this uh, presentation up available um, on my website in a little bit. Oh, it's already there, so I'll tell you where the link is. Kill switch around the map. That was the most spectacular piece of work writing I've ever seen. Less than 1,500 words. 
three pages in the LNCS uh, template. Something like 60 citations. The density of citing and referencing was outstanding. <clears throat> the choice of words was spectacular. And some of the words were designed to provoke thought. It's an amazing piece of thematic literature review. The best thematic literature review I have ever seen by none. Bar PhD students? Nah. PhD theses? Nah. Academic writing? Nah. This is spectacular. Mature student. But all of them are choosing stuff, their topic, from four big topics that associates with them, that they associate with particularly. That was about um, AI as it happened. Working with a group of second year students had an amazing uh, idea from a, a young female Muslim from Iran, I think she was. A new biomedical sensor to monitor uterus and cervix condition and function. And I asked her, if you're Muslim and you're from Iran, is it safe for you to write that? Yeah, she said, no problem at all. Perfectly happy to do it. And it's a beautiful piece of work. Or automated sensory lighting for autism. This guy was a father of an autistic lad. And using that, he came up with some very, very interesting ideas that we could use smart technology for. A Gulf State guy, I'm not sure how old he is, mature student, a biker. Again, you can see an app for motorcycle riders, but not just ordinary motorcycle, but Harley Davidson riders. It was really interesting because Harley Davidson riders tend to be a kind of a, a group worldwide, internationally. And so he focused in on something special there. And it was a matter of talking with him about various ideas. Now this one was the most interesting one, I think, of all. He was a guy who was very quiet. Didn't seem to be doing very much. And I spent probably half an hour of a, a seminar, of a workshop with him. What are you interested? And out of it eventually, after going around the houses a few times, <coughs> it turned out <coughs> that while he was at school, he was very active as a swimmer. But since he'd come to university, he'd not been near a swimming pool. So we had a bit of a discussion about that. Well, what aspect of swimming could something like this technology be useful for? And we kind of went round about. And eventually, he came up with this clever way of using some sort of sensor that could be useful in swimming pools to identify people getting into trouble. If it, particularly when a swimming pool is big and it's full of people, it's difficult to see what's going on. Now, so he found a certain idea, a topic which is interesting, but the result was more interesting. I went back, we had kind a of chapter in the next week and then the third, second week after that. It turned out he'd started swimming again. He discovered his love of swimming and he started going to swimming pools to do his swimming. It changed his life a bit. He became more interested, more interested in interesting and interested in things. So first question to finish. Are all of your students achieving their potential? Are any taboos, well, the ones I've talked about, or any other taboos that you feel apply to you, are they hindering you in coaching and mentoring and inspiring all of your students to achieve exceptional things? Thank you very much. Um, we have a, if you